I'm uh, Vali Nasser, uh, the Dean of SAIS, and it is uh, my distinct honor to welcome all of you to Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. It is also uh, uh, my particular pleasure to, uh, to welcome everyone to a women's uh, um, learning partnership event, given that in various capacities I was witness to the birth of this organization, to its uh, uh, growth over time to the contributions that is made, and I'm very pleased uh, that uh, although I'm not uh, uh, within the main vein of its uh, mission, that uh, I've witnessed that it has uh, had a very big impact on not on women's issues but on human rights issues and on a, a way in which we address and look at global issues, and I've seen firsthand uh, how it has impacted uh, public discourse on human rights and women, particularly uh, in the Muslim world, and uh, it's uh, brought about a very novel approach to uh, understanding the issues and connecting those who are affected by it and are leading the dialogue. So uh, it's wonderful for me in this capacity to be able to uh, see yet another event uh, in the uh, life of this organization and uh, to see it to continue to prosper and impact uh, many more people. Now, uh, uh, let me say a little bit about uh, the institution that you're in and how uh, SAIS also relates to uh, these um, issues. Uh, SAIS is one of the world's preeminent graduate schools of international relations. Uh, for decades, uh, this school has dedicated itself to educating women and men for careers in leadership in both public and uh, private sectors. We are actually very proud that uh, uh, SAIS has been among the very first graduate schools of its kind to train a generation of women who took leadership positions both in this country and above, ab abroad in the, the public sector. SAIS's education prioritizes a cross-disciplinary approach to solving the world's problems, uh, one that understands how economics impacts security how cultures shape governance, and how conflict limits uh, uh, prosperity. And we train our students uh, in order to understand the way in which uh, these complex issues work in the world that we live in. As we advance the dialogue on human security uh, during today's conference, we should be guided by a similar cross-disciplinary approach. Progress requires placing people at the core of security matters and looking at the many factors contributing to their problems, whether they are environmental, legal, or economic. We meet during a time of incredible insecurity in the world, after a period where we may have been lulled into thinking that globalization and convergence of markets and a, a universal uh, uh, culture of human rights may have done away with conflict. We are seeing a, an unprecedented resurgence of conflicts around the world. There are over 35 armed conflicts currently underway. Four wars began last year alone. Fatalities and population displacements are on the rise. Governments and multilateral institutions are unable to respond to the needs of the displaced. Refugee crises are happening at a greater scale and greater frequency than international organizations or governments can respond to them. And children and women are among the most vulnerable in all of these instances. Now, human security today, perhaps, constitutes a, the most significant uh, global challenge that we face, on par with such other issues as climate change or uh, health, global health issues that have uh, been on the forefront. It is a humanitarian concern, but it is much more than that. And if we look at for the Middle East, an area that at least I'm familiar with, it's very clear that humanitarian crises now constitute the core of global security issues. When the conflict in Syria began, the global community and particularly the leadership in the United States and Europe, was able to stay away from that conflict, arguing that it is a humanitarian tragedy that constitutes no security challenge. That in the United States, the assumption was 
that as tragic as the situation in Syria was, the United States had no vital interest in Syria. There was a moral imperative, but not a security imperative. And Europe was able to shun the conflict, arguing that the crises within its own territory in, in Greece, in Ireland, in Spain and Portugal were much more important to it and that it really did not have a um, vital interest at play in Syria. It took uh, the humanitarian tragedy of the Yazidis in Iraq, where a, an entire population was decimated and turned into refugees, and women in particular were affected by uh, the, the bizarre uh, uh, policies of the so-called Islamic State. And then the magnitude of the refugee crisis that is gripping Europe and perhaps constitutes the most significant threat to Europe's uh, uh, conception of itself, conception of its moral obligation in the world order, and in very material ways impacts European economy and security to change those attitudes. Now, solutions to these crises are very difficult, as we are seeing Europe uh, contort itself in varieties of ways to address the wave of refugees coming in. But it is exactly for that reason why attending to this issue and the manner that you're doing in this conference today is so important. SAIS and the Women's Learning Partnership invite you to consider these issues as we reignite re international dialogue on the place of human rights in policy making and share proven models for alleviating human insecurity in the world today. I'm very pleased to welcome the many experts, practitioners, and emerging young leaders who join us from around the globe today at this conference. I would also like to thank my colleague and friend, Mahnaz Afghami, the founder and president of Women's Learning Partnership for her leadership. And Mahnaz has been a mentor to me. I've uh, learned a great deal from her in varieties of ways, but I've also witnessed firsthand her indefatigable uh, efforts on behalf of human rights, human security, and women's issues, and the manner in which he has, she has brought to bear her vast experience with these issues that spans a number of decades to addressing uh, uh, current concerns, and in particular in connecting those affected across many different continents and many different countries, but who share, uh, share the same issues and who confront the same problems into a single movement in order to address uh, these critical issues. Uh, throughout her career, she has been a steadfast advocate of not only women's rights, but also human rights, and has been both an intellectual and, and a uh, policy leader in, in addressing these issues. So it's particularly great pleasure to welcome her to SAIS as well. And I would like na uh, to now turn the stage to Mahnaz, who will say a few words as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nas, uh, for this wonderful presentation, overview of, of the issues we are facing, both as individuals, communities, and as women internationally. And thank you very much for your supportive words for WLB and for me. Uh, the mentorship has been mutual. Uh, uh, Dr. Nas is my uh, uh, most uh, admired and uh, uh, most trusted advisor. Whenever there is an issue, uh, I try to reach him and uh, he makes himself available no matter where he is. And uh, we happen to reach each other at airports from Bahrain to uh, China. And uh, he's always, always there for women. Uh, and uh, so thank you so much for hosting us and for your support, continuing support. I want to uh, welcome uh, the partnership uh, from around the world and uh, who have taken a lot of trouble to be here. Uh, several of them were not able to, including uh, Talakan Esmailova, who uh, is stuck in Kyrgyzstan, and uh, the others uh, have made it, and uh, one of our other uh, countries was not able to get here either, but uh, it's preferable not to mention that, I guess. <laughs> 
uh, we always have issues of, of what we can say and what we can't say for the safety of our partners. Uh, I also want to thank uh, these distinguished speakers, uh, especially uh, Zainab, whom I'll say a few words about later, uh, the Zainab Bangura, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, and uh, Pat Mitchell, a uh, dear friend and the uh, president, former president of PBS, and we'll, I'll say a few words about her later as well, and the other wonderful experts that we have uh, joining us today, and the young people who are going to energize us and tell us what we're going to do as we move forward. Uh, actually, um, today, uh, today we're not only celebrating the 15th anniversary of WLP, but the 20th anniversary of Beijing. The two are very interconnected for us because we, uh, WLP, as an idea, actually took shape in Beijing. We were there after, uh, some of us, after having been in uh, previous UN conferences, and uh, from Mexico, which had about uh, seven, 800 uh, organizations represented, to Beijing that suddenly had 35,000 organizations, huge energy, huge enthusiasm, huge dy dynamism. And uh, we were searching as a group to see what is missing. Is it, why is it that we still haven't gotten to where we needed to get? And so it led us to, a, to several years of reviewing uh, our past history, women's past history, and trying to search the cause of all this energy not being where it should be and not being realized. And that study and that soul searching and that brainstorming led us to look at history and to see that in spite of this fantastic and wonderful diversity and differences that exist among women and the ways they live their lives, everything is almost exactly the same across the world so far as the actual power structure and the actual role of women is concerned. Everywhere men have the space the outside space to present themselves, the public space, and the women are in the private space. This is, of course, in the earlier times. Things changed in certain parts of the world faster. Everywhere, men are able to and encouraged to innovate, to create, to have new ideas, and women are not. Uh, everywhere, uh, men have a right to take uh, uh, pride in their masculinity, in their physical uh, appearance, in their physical traits, women are not. Some places they hide them top to toe with just a slit for their eyes. Some places, like in China, they used to break their bones of their feet so that they would have two inch lotus feet. Some places they mutilated them in order to su uh, suppress their sexuality. Uh, everywhere there was this idea of limitation, somehow keeping women in their space, and an idea of danger related to women's bodily presence. Now, we found out that this is true, but it is really not a matter of culture. It's not a matter of tradition so much as a matter of history. Women were not this way because some group of men or a whole lot of men across the globe decided to squeeze women into these particular spots or to subjugate them. It was because this is what was required. If you were constantly having children, constantly either pregnant or uh, breastfeeding or taking care of uh, a large number of children until such a time that some of them would survive, and be supports for you when you were older and economic uh, support for you when you were living, then of course there was this kind of division needed. Somebody had to do this and somebody had to do the other. And the physical strength that was necessary for the kind of work that was done and the way uh, 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 money was made and, and the economics uh, was uh, handled and war and peace were handled. So this was long time ago. And then as science uh, uh, changed, as diseases were controlled, as uh, reproductive rights were controlled, and as industrial revolution brought ways of working and ways of production that changed the way we lived, 
changed the way we participated and women became even more of a, uh, they, they'd always worked, but they became, it became possible for them to work in the public space. Things changed, but not fast enough. It was a matter of history. As we developed in certain parts of the world, it was possible for women to take more roles and stronger roles, and in certain parts, it took longer to do this. And what we need to realize now, that after we became able to educate ourselves, to demand political rights, we have to remember that until the end of the 19th century, actually the very end of the 19th century, no woman on earth had the right to wor work or stand for office. New Zealand was the first country that gave the right to vote to women. So as this happened, as we became more capable of studying, educating ourselves, participating in politics and so forth, things began to change. But not fast enough and not fast enough for everybody. So all of this is happening at Beijing as we are deciding these things and, and talking about these things. And then again in Casablanca, and then again in Beirut, and then again uh, in Turkey, elsewhere. The, the dialogue continued. So we decided, actually, that we need to think, why is it that this doesn't the change that has happened in the world around us that should make it possible for everyone to participate, for all women to participate, why isn't it not happening? And we came to the conclusion that in order to sustain the older system, there had to be all sorts of support, literature, the arts, religion, the political structure, the economic structure, structure all of these had to support the system to keep it. And women were a part of that. They were a part of keeping that system because they were the makers of culture and the keepers of culture. So all of that has to change and it's not easy. It's not going to happen overnight. So the UN uh, uh, conferences helped a great deal in the sense that they made us have the space in which to connect, to exchange, to learn from each other, to make a movement. And as that happened, uh, we were uh, really reaching out. There were declarations and resolutions which spelled out in detail exactly what we wish, exactly what we want for ourselves and for others. And at the end of that century and the beginning of the 21st century, we had all the heads of state gathering together, agreeing to the uh, Millennium Development Goals, the UN started the human security, saying that it's not only human rights, we have to push human rights to cover human security, that it's not only freedom of speech, it's not only freedom of political expression, it is a roof over our heads, it's food for ourselves, it's dignity that comes from having that security. So we were all very excited and enthusiastic, and then the crash came, the horrendous 9-11, and after that, forget about human rights. I mean, people could be arrested because they were going to be terrorists or maybe ter terrorists or could look like terrorists. Uh, all of a sudden, habeas corpus disappeared. You could disappear somebody and with no, no uh, problems. Uh, you, uh, you all know, and the dean mentioned and, uh, the, what happened and what followed. So uh, what we as WLP, have discovered and, and have worked together to learn is one that we need to get back to a global vision of human rights which we seem in our anxiety for security to completely overlook. In our anxiety to, be, to have some illusory perfect security, we have basically put aside our concern for what makes this security even worthwhile, what makes our lives worthwhile. So we need to reintroduce the most elementary, the most essential, the most universal concepts that we all committed to and worked for for many years. So this is one piece of it. The other piece of it that we have to build bridges across differences. Everybody is guilty in the process of losing the rights that we have had and overstepping them, and everybody 
is proud because they have had a piece of it in their culture, their religion, and they have moved it forward as much as they could. So we need to get back together to do that. And we need to get back together as women, not only to look for our own oppression, for our own uh, losses, for our own the violence that we have experienced, but I think after years of raising consciousness, after ra years of bringing awareness, the conditions have not changed, but the consciousness has come about. Even ISIS has to say something about women. It's a horrible thing they say about women, but they have to recognize women. We're not invisible anymore. So what we want to do basically is to think more globally, to dare, to actually have the courage not to just say we want 50% of a world which is a terrible world, which is a messy one, which is not a good one, and we haven't had much role in building it. Now we want to say we want 100%. We want to have the vision for all of us, and we want to do it with men. That doesn't mean we give up our struggle, our uh, abuse, working for to eliminate our abuses, but our vision is for a world which might be quite, and I hope it will be quite different than the one we have experienced. And to get back to WLP's 15 years of experience, the essential thing that we need to do in order to reach to that, uh, that world, we as a partnership have discovered that it is rearranging the architecture of human relationships from bottom up, from child, from father to child, from father to mother, all the way to teacher to child, all the way to employer, employee, government, uh, and non-governmental. We have to rethink this, and the women's vision, which has not been a part of that, has to come into that. And that change of the architecture of human relationships is what we are actually dedicated to and working for. So. Today we are here together to both point out from our various uh, points of view what are the worst things that we have experienced and we have seen and the deteriorations and what are the things that we have found that work and how do we change this history of differentiation, exclusion and separation and violence, which is not only about women, although a large piece of it has been about women, but it's against races, it's against countries, it's against sex, sex segments of society. So how do we make a friendlier earth to live on and relate to each other in a more constructive way? So today we're going to put our heads together and especially with the young generation who are going to have to do it. We can enumerate the miseries, but the young people are the ones who are going to change all of that and make it faster and more efficient and more uh, all-encompassing. So we're going to work together today in order to see what is the world we seek and how are we going to get there, at least begin the conversation seriously once again. So thank you for being here. And thank you for engaging in this dialogue. Thank you. And now I would like to call to the podium my very dear friend, uh, Zainab Bengura. Uh, she, I, she, I, don't, I won't say much about her. She's got so much, so much to uh, talk about. But all I want to say is that she's been Minister of Foreign Relations, uh, she has been uh, all sorts, has had all sorts of official titles. She is now one of the highest level international activists uh, at the United Nations. And activist is the word, you know, because no matter what post she has held, how much diplomacy it has involved, how much patience it has involved, and how much efficiency, she is at heart an activist, a rebel, uh, someone who you, we can all count on to get us to the world we seek. If I were a young woman, a child, a growing adolescent, and if I wanted a role model, it would be Zainab Bangura. 
And even today, <laughs> no longer being a girl or a young person, she still is the one I would have liked to have been. So Zainab, please come and talk to us. Thank you very much. I, I actually think Manaz is biased, so please don't accept all the things she said. Um, Dr. Vali Nas, Dean of the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, moderator, Pats, Manaz, my friend and sister, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure to join you for this timely and critical conference to reignite the dialogue on human security, by which we mean freedom from want and freedom from fear, and to mobilize for human rights 20 years after the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action which remains a blueprint for gender equality. My mandate to spearhead efforts across the United Nations system to end the scourge of conflict-related sexual violence shows that we are still in pursuit of the Beijing platform. This historic document, framed by the women's movement, as Manas has explained, provided the precedent for Security Council Resolution 1820, which condemned sexual violence as a tactic of war and impediment to peace building. The Beijing platform sounded the alarm, stating, and I quote, parties to conflict often rape women with impunity, sometimes using systematic rape as a tactic of war and terrorism, end of quote. When governments were negotiating Resolution 1820, they looked to this language. They built on the ground broken by women at Beijing. Today, the notion of sexual violence as a tactic of war and terrorism has traveled from Beijing to the world's paramount peace and security body, the United Nations Security Council which established my mandate and reaffirm that there can be no security without women's security. As you already heard, we meet in a milestone year for global policy, including not only the Beijing Plus 20 review, but also the 15th anniversary of Resolution 1325, the high-level review of peacekeeping operations and a target year for implementation of the Millennium Development Goals. Yet, as we take stock of the achievements made and welcome the advent of a new sustainable development agenda, the confluence of global crises threaten to stall or even reverse the progress that has been made. This includes rising violent extremism and levels of civilian displacement not seen since the Second World War. I have witnessed firsthand in many war-torn corners of the world the overlapping crisis in public health, education, infrastructure, and living standard caused by armed conflict. I have seen the threats posed to women's life and livelihoods. One of the greatest threats in the widespread and systematic use of sexual violence in the wars of antiquity in cities occupied or under siege. Rape, sexual slavery, and forced marriage was simply what it meant to be a woman in a war zone. Today, women's bodies are still being used as battlefields in wars started by men. What should have been so long ago relegated to the history books remain in our daily headlines. My recent visit to settings such as Syria, Iraq and Nigeria make me wonder 
why extremist groups that seem to harbor so fear, no fear of bloodshed or death are so afraid of women's freedom? Is it hard to believe that in the 21st century, women and girls have been auctioned, sold, and traded in slave markets, reminiscence of the Middle Ages? Sometimes for a few thousand dinar, sometimes for as little as a pack of cigarettes. In the political economy of the Syrian conflict, women are part of the currency ISIL uses to consolidate its power. Women and girls find themselves under assault every day and with every step they take, whether at border crossings, checkpoints, during house searches, in detention centers, and in the very camps where they seek refuge. The greatest guarantor of women's rights is a peaceful state. Statistics show that maternal mortality rates more than double in war-torn countries. The number of women holding legal title to land is almost half in the wake of war. The net enrollment of girls in primary school drops dramatically, while early marriage spikes. Discussions of statistics and policy framework can often seem attract. But let me tell you what I see when I think about the face of poverty. It is the face of a woman who has been raped, cast out of her home and community, and forced to fend for herself and her dependent children in an environment of ongoing insecurity. This woman will confront greater threats and take greater risk because the basic health and subsistence needs of her family are not met. In this way, the vicious cycle of violence and exploitation continues. But we can push back. Sustainable develop human security and human and sexual violence prevention are interlocking issues. There can be no economic or social security without women's security. No peace without peace of mind for women and their families. And no development when half of society's potential is squandered. It is time to remove the barriers to women's full economic and political participation and elevate gender equality to the hearts of the global policy agenda. After all, women cannot hold half the sky, as the Asian Chinese proverb says, if they are trapped beneath glass ceilings. It remains sad but true that the higher you go in any organization, the fewer, fewer women there are. And the more powerful the institution, the less likely it is that women's perspective will be represented. Two decades since Beijing, we still haven't closed the gender gap in terms of women's workforce participation. Women remain dramatically underrepresented in the justice and security sector. As a local activist told me in South Sudan, we live under the rule of men, not under the rule of law. Often, rape survivors feel twice victimized, once by the crime itself and again by the police and judicial system that trivialize their trauma. Moreover, women are still widely viewed as repository of family and community honor, which means that the stigma and shame of rape is borne by the victim rather than the perpetrator. Indeed, of all the forces that hold women back, none are as powerful as entrenched beliefs. The process of socialization into gender roles include the blaming and shaming of women for the violence inflicted upon them. By turning victims into outcasts, widespread rape can shred an entire social fabric. I firmly believe in challenging entrenched beliefs and taboos. No problem can ever be solved through silence. Media mobilization can play an important role in this regard. Raising the profiles of issues like sexual violence that have, have had a hidden history. The Beijing platform recognized the potential of the media to make a positive contribution to gender equality, calling for reporting that challenges gender stereotypes. Yet, we also see that media technologies are not always a force for good. 
Extremist groups have earned social media to spread their message of violence and hatred, to attract attention, and thereby swell their ranks with new recruits. ISIL is using modern communication technology in service of a medieval ideology and agenda. Information is their oxygen, and we must find ways to suffocate them. Working with local and religious leaders can help to shift social norms. We must put an end to the use of religion, tradition, or culture as an argument against gender equality. As the Beijing Declaration made clear, national customs are never an excuse for not guaranteeing all individual human rights and fundamental freedoms. Culture does not make people. People make culture. So it is possible and indeed imperative to change cultures of impunity for sexual and gender-based violence into cultures of deterrence. Contemporary interstate conflicts have been described as wars among people, and the people least empowered always suffer most. This is reflected in the Beijing platform, which stipulates that although entire communities suffer the consequences of armed conflict and terrorism, women and girls are particularly affected because of their status in society and their sex. This acknowledges that women are acutely susceptible to the hardship caused by war, being already victims of discrimination and exclusion in terms of peace. Efforts to address this will not be effective until the level of resources matches the scale of the problem. The 20-year review of the implementation of Beijing platform reveal that major gaps in financing for gender equality and women's empowerment persist. This shows the need for gender responsive budgeting, attaching dedicated budgets to policy frameworks such as national action plans on women, peace, and security, using tools like the gender markers to assess and improve performance and increase support for women's civil society organizations. But there is another side to the story. In 2014, global military spending was 13 times higher than development aid allocation. This means there is a greater global investment in warfare than human welfare. And as a recent report by the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom notes, we get what we pay for. We're all here at this conference because we take women's rights and security seriously. So let us be bold and picture a world free from gender-based violence. This will be a world where no woman walks in fear of the sound of footsteps behind her at night, where no girl's dreams are deferred because threats and intimidation prevent her from attending school, and where women are equally represented on the front line of law enforcement, throughout the security sector and in the upper echelon of political power. We're here today because this is the world we seek. It may be an elusive, even utopian goal. Yet all of these things, freedom of movement, freedom from violence, the right to an education, to equal opportunity and participation in public life, are obligations, not just aspirations. They are the great unfinished business of Beijing and indeed of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights before it, which laid the foundation for human security and placed human rights at the heart of international relations. Allow me to end on a personal note by saying that I speak to you today not only as a United Nations official and not only as a former government minister, but as someone who knows what it means to be vulnerable, discounted and devalued because I was born a woman, and to be targeted for violence as a woman who spoke against my nation's brutal civil war, in which an estimated 65,000 women were raped. Although I was not at Beijing, it is part of my story. In 1996, directly inspired by the Beijing process, the women of Sierra Leone mobilized to call for peace and democracy. Beijing had built networks of solidarity among women activists and leaders, 
making it possible for me to rally them together ahead of our first democratic election in June of that year. So the Beijing platform was our platform, and we used it to stand up and call for peace and political change. Now it is the next generation of young women who will take the baton of Beijing forward. This will be a marathon rather than a split. But we have to set our sights on 2030 as the finishing line and expiring date for gender-based inequality and violence in all its forms. Thank you for your hard work and shared commitment to this cause. Thank you. Thank you.